Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Robert Rosenbaum. I'm the Managing Director for Newton, the National University Technology Network. You have heard about us from, from Alex and Kim and a few folks uh, throughout the week this week. And as always, I want to thank you again for letting us crash with you in the big city. And it's been a fantastic week here. We're always glad to come back. Uh, we do have a few of our board members uh, who are here this morning, and I want to do a quick introduction of them before I hand this off uh, for our first panel of the day. And I'm not wearing my glasses, so if I miss anyone in the back row, let me know. Uh, first, Dr. Mel Muchnik. Wave, Mel. <laughs> uh, he is our chair emeritus, uh, retired in the high life now, but formerly and still in some degree in spirit with Governor State University uh, in Illinois. Everyone knows Alex Pickett, I'm sure. Uh, but just in case you don't, that's Alex. Um, on this side of the room, we've got Mark Halsey, uh, Executive Director of the University System of Maryland at Hagerstown. He's also the finance chair on the Newton board. Um, no longer a board member, but since she's in the next row, everybody knows Kim Scalzo. Uh, so hi, Kim. Thanks for, for being here. This is Teresa Pittman, uh, Associate Vice President of Teaching and Learning at College of the North Atlantic in Newfoundland, Labrador, in Labrador, Canada. I can't talk this morning. I'll uh, keep going back. Uh, Dr. Justin Lauder, uh, Texas Tech University, Associate Vice Provost for e-learning and academic partnerships now, right? So um, Justin gets all the things at Tech they don't know what to do with. It becomes an academic partnership, and he gets that. And then I'm going to harass Dr. Kevin Bell on the back row, uh, who's presenting this morning on one of the panels, but is also a former board member. And Kevin is Pro Vice Chancellor of Digital Futures at uh, Western Sydney University. And I think that is all of our folks. And with that, uh, the remaining board member is going to take over from here, and that's Dr. Pam Quinn, Provost of the RGN McCoy Center for Educational Telecommunications in the Dallas County Community College District, and more importantly, my boss, so I'm glad I got her <laughs> title right. Uh, so with that, Pam, they're all yours. Very good. Thank you again. Um, Robert is right in saying we're delighted to be here again to work with you. This is really a terrific conference. Good speakers, good interaction, and good conversations. And that's what this morning's panel is going to be about, if our panelists would like to come on forward. Um, we, don't have a, we don't have PowerPoints. We're talking. We want you to ask questions. We want you to share experiences. So if you've got a comment or as people are talking, I mean, if you, you know, would like to ask a question, please do so. And at the end, we hope to finish up so that we really can have a little more dialogue um, with the group. Um, we had, we have three presenters, and I'm the moderator. Um, Teresa Pittman is the Associate Vice President of Teaching and Learning at the College of the North Atlantic in Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. Teresa is in the center here. Uh, Dr. Karen Powell is President Retired of the American Public University System. And Elizabeth Chibachi, uh, excuse me, Kevin Bell. Uh, Liz let us know last night that she would not be able to make it today. So I tapped Kevin um, just a little bit ago and asked him if he could sit in. Um, he is well versed in um, multiple uh, um, educational systems, but he is most recently in a new position of two years in at Western Sydney. No, is it Western Sydney University? Is that right? Okay, not university, you told us. Okay, Western Sydney University, which is a relatively new institution. And um, since I wanted uh, the panelists to uh, give us their background as well as a little bit about their institution, so you know the environment in which they, from which they are coming, I'm going to go ahead and start with um, Dr. Karen Powell and let her go ahead and talk about her background and what she's done. And as you can see here, we are well represented with the United States, Canada, and Australia. And I may be jumping in on some of these as well. So, Karen? Thanks, Pam. So um, I have been with American Public University System for the last 15 years and retired, uh, quasi-retired, in October. I don't even know what retirement means yet, so still trying to figure that out. But I, was, I started at APUS as a member of the Board of Trustees. I then um, was the appointed the interim chancellor when our um, chancellor was retired. And then I became an interim provost, all as a member of the board. Left the board, came back as an academic dean, 
uh, later became the provost and later became the president. Uh, American public university system consists of American military university and American public university. It is 100% online. Uh, when I started, we had about 3,000 students, and we have between 90 and 100,000 students, and our largest uh, size was at 120,000 at one point. Um, primarily serves the military. 60% of the students are active duty military. Uh, most of our students are working adults. The average age is 30. The average age of graduate students is 32. We offer degrees at all levels, associates, bachelors, masters, and doctorate. Prior, for my own personal experience, prior to that I'd been at Georgetown University uh, and I also had my own consulting practice. And I got to APUS because one of my students at Georgetown uh, was employed at the fledgling APUS and said they should bring me on as a board member. And so that's how I got connected from one place to the other. Um, prior to Georgetown, I was in um, ministry for many years, so I have a very eclectic background, and um, met the person that brought me to Georgetown on a plane to Rome, and that's how it all happened. So for me, it's always been connections that have moved me to the next phase. Um, but that's a little bit about me and the institution. The institution, um, you know, it's like any uh, online institution in many ways. We have monthly starts. We have probably 2,000 faculty all around the world. Uh, we have six schools within APU and AMU, um, including arts and humanities, business, homeland security, especially serving the military. A lot of national security, homeland security, intel programs are kind of our flagship programs. Uh, business, a whole, the whole array of things, health sciences. Thanks, Karen. Good morning, everyone. So? Think so? Okay. Can't hear myself. Um, I work with College of the North Atlantic. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the um, island of Newfoundland, and uh, Labrador is on is on the mainland. So we're east, uh, the most easterly province in Canada. Um, we have 17 campuses on the island and in Labrador, and one campus in Doha, in Qatar. Uh, which I hope to go to next week if I can ever get a flight out of New York <laughs> and home change my clothes. Um, so we ha have a lot of rural campuses and a few urban campuses, but it's uh, mostly smaller campuses. I manage the Distributed Learning Center. I've been doing that for the last seven, eight years. And in the last year, I've actually taken on the role of Associate VP of Teaching and Learning because we're reestablishing a new Center for Teaching and Learning, and which kind of grew out of our Distributed Learning Center. And so that's my main mission, and I've got a lot of great information this week, actually, to help us with that. So my background, I've been in public education and government for the last 22.4 years. I was working on my leave uh, thing yesterday, and uh, apparently that's what it is. So it seems like a lot uh, less than that, but I have uh, worked in the administration, and I've worked as a manager probably, probably about 15 years of that. But I also worked on the government and the policy and in standards and accreditation. So I think it's good to have both sides of the, of the perspective. And I've also worked in K-12 in the school board for about two years. My background is mainly business and IT. Worked as a program analyst when I first got out of school, kind of built the IT piece, which kind of went into the education piece, which is kind of where you end up with educational technologies and then kind of landed where I'm to in that field, so. Kevin? Okay, I think mine switched on. Um, I think probably the easiest is to talk a little bit about how I got to here before I talk about where here is. Um, so I met my um, now significant other in, in Japan where we both were teaching languages. Um, she was actually a trainer for the company that I worked for, so as I mentioned a few times, she was my boss from day one. Um, we decided, she's French-Canadian, so I know where these places are that Teresa just mentioned, um, and I'm from England, so we sort of looked at a map and thought, well, America's kind of in the middle. Um, she found an interest in intercultural management program that she fancied doing at a small um, college in Brattleboro, Vermont, called the School for International Training, which is actually quite an interesting school, and I was going to go there and just hang out on a mountaintop and study kanji, because we were coming from Japan, and there was a pregnancy involved. So I was going to be a, an earth father studying kanji, and, and that hasn't really worked out for me, to be honest. Um, 
So while we were there, um, she, she decided she was going to go. She, she was going to go and do her masters, and she was worried that I would be at home idle, and thought she needed to keep me busy. So we fired up the Sony VAIO that we'd bought just before we left Japan, and she found this kind of small graduate school connected to a liberal arts college that was in downtown Brattleboro, and they'd been running for a couple of years um, a hybrid few master's programs in teaching business and, uh, and computer engineering. Um, so she said, you should go and talk to them, go and pop down. So I did talk to them, and, and within about five minutes, I'd signed up. Um, that was the graduate school of Marlborough College. Marlborough College is a very small um, liberal arts college, about 100 student intake. So I always sort of reflect back on that when we start talking numbers and budgets. I've kind of been there with 100 students and a budget that reflects that. Um, but I went to the grad school, which at the time was doing really well. It was, it, was, it was an early hybrid program. So we went every two weeks on a Friday, Saturday into the facility, and the rest was all distant. And this was dial-up in Vermont. So again, <clears throat> I get it when people start saying, you know, bandwidth can be an issue and that sort of thing. Um, and just was intrigued by the format. I, I liked um, the ability to sort of prep a little bit and then go and sound like I vaguely knew what I was talking about in the face-to-faces. And we did a few synchronous sort of Yahoo instant messenger type things um, and, and enjoyed the program, did okay with it. Um, and just before I graduated, they asked if I, uh, sorry, before I graduated, I got, I got the chance of a dot-com job. That was my one dot-com career, which came because I was playing soccer with a guy whose brother was uh, involved with that. So I moved into Boston and worked for a Finnish telecommunications company. I think I got the job of web manager because I said, do you want to educate your customers? I sort of did the MAT program at Marlborough. So have always sort of had one foot corporate, one foot education or academia since then. Um, when I finished the Marlborough program, they were partnering with Cambridge College in Cambridge, <clears throat> just outside Boston, and asked if I would uh, adjunct and teach, some of the, teach a couple of the courses that I'd just taken with them. Um, so no master plan with that. 9-11 happened. The, the dot-com sort of went by the wayside, and Marlborough asked if I fancied being more involved there. So I went back and taught for them and uh, sort of helped out generally. The... Um, thinking of the order of the way this happened. I worked for a while for New England College as, as director of academic uh, programs, and then got a phone call from Marlborough again saying, do you fancy applying to be the director of the Grad Institute? So I did that and went back. Um, I didn't quite overlap with the guy who was president when I was a student there, but most of you all know his name. He, uh, that was Paul LeBlanc, and I inherited my predecessor's inbox and lots of correspondence between Paul and her. She was called Claudine. Um, and I thought, this guy sounds, sounds uh, interesting and fun. And, and what struck me was how many times he made a decision and said, let's do this, let's do this. And then I'd see the email afterwards saying, yeah, that didn't kind of work out. And he, he never got sort of bent by that. He, he kept trying with new initiatives, et cetera. So I managed to sort of keep loosely in touch with him. Fast forward another three, four years, and he called and said, there's a couple of positions at Southern New Hampshire I'd like you to come up for. Do you fancy coming up and, and having a... Uh, a chat. So I did um, and became the chief academic officer of their online and continuing ed program in 2004, I'm going to say. Uh, near enough. 2006, I think it was. Um, <clears throat> and did that and was obviously uh, fortunate with the time and in that that was the period that Southern New Hampshire went from about 20, 30,000 up to about 80,000 enrollments, the majority of which were in online. Um, <clears throat> And I think we're talking about that a little bit this afternoon, so I'll not go too much into the details of how we, how we did that, how we structured it, the successes and failures, but it went ultimately pretty well. Um, and I kept talking with Paul and saying, you know, we should do some of this innovation thing, keep doing it, and um, maybe I could have Friday afternoon just to go and sit in a dark corner somewhere and not talk to people. Um, and Paul being Paul sort of took that kernel of an idea and then came back and, and doubled down and doubled down and did that again and said, okay, can you move from where you are now in the mill yard and go and sit in this quiet room with three others that I've picked and you can run the innovation lab? And I said, okay, on a Friday afternoon? He said, no, no, every day. Um, <clears throat> so I went and uh, was the academic lead on the innovation lab at Southern New Hampshire, which was the area where we generated what became College for America, um, the competency-based direct assessment program. It had about 12 names before that, but that was where we finished up. Um, I'd been contemplating doing my doctorate for quite a while, and Paul and Southern New Hampshire were going to support that. Um, I did, however, go into an open house in, in Boston and met my subsequent boss, who was a graduate of the Penn program 
Um, and he and Northeastern offered to uh, support that even more so. And it was a real opportunity that I couldn't uh, pass up. So I moved from southern New Hampshire to, um, to Northeastern, where I led the College of Professional Studies work in online and continuing education. Um, they've got about six or seven regional campuses, so we ramped that up. Um, and had a, had a great time. Uh, also did the same thing, got sort of moved across to lead um, an innovation lab that uh, launched what we called the Lowell Institute, which was a um, first in the world FIPSI federal funded grant. We got $4 million for that, uh, which beat the $1 million we got from Gates for the Southern New Hampshire project. Um, and I led and oversaw that until two years ago when I got an email from Western Sydney University. I'd been commuting from Boston on a three-hour um, trek and got tired of that, so got a flat in the city and then realized after the doctorate was finished that I was kind of far away from my family for no apparent reason and not loving that. So we looked at options. Um, we looked at a couple of options in Vermont, um, one in Seattle, and then uh, Australia. That seemed to be the logical conclusion of that search. So, um, so I'll talk a little bit more about where Western Sydney's at. It did uh, have a big rebrand and, and change from the University of Western Sydney to Western Sydney University, so you can't get that wrong. Um, and we've been there a couple of years. Uh, I have family and kids, and they're very happy down there, and I am too, but it's really nice to be back in cold and freezing wet New York, because uh, I do miss the place and love being here. So I'll talk more about sort of where Western Sydney is and that sort of thing, but that is the random, rambling, sorry, um, journey that, that uh, sort of went from Marlborough College through to Western Sydney. Well, our panel is going to be talking about leadership, leadership um, as just in the term of leadership, but also in the field of online and distance learning. And um, my background, I'm with, I've been with the Dallas County Community College District um, since the early 80s, and we've looked at almost every technology there was. We were really heavy with the production of high-quality telecourses on PBS and have just gone through satellite cable, ITFS, you know, two-way video, all of this um, up into online. So now we're all kind of in the online world. And one of the things I was going to ask the panelists is what are some of the characteristics or what are some of the most important characteristics that you have used or that you continue to use to help make you a successful leader? And uh, I'll just start out that one of the things that I often hear about my leadership style is I hear this, thanks for valuing my work. So some of the things that I know people need from leaders is to feel valued in what they do and um, to empathize with them and, and um, just to support what they do. And that's been some of my experience. But I'll pass this one off then to Karen. Okay, so... Um where to start, but I, I think when I, when I asked the question, I jotted down a few notes, and the very most important piece for me is authenticity. You have to be who you are. You can't be anybody but who you are. And to the extent that any leader or any person tries to be something they're not, they're not gonna be successful. And so I think authenticity for me and bringing who I am the whole of who I am, my spirituality, my intellect, my emotional intelligence, my whole presence and being fully present is really important no matter where I've been or who I've been with and, and has helped me to move along. Another characteristic that I think has been really important for me is um, being open to learn no matter what the situation is. To not feel that I have to have the right answer which leaders sometimes feel like they've got to have the answer, they've got to know. Well, the best way to know is to not know and to allow others to help guide you. And so being open to feedback, being open to learning, and you know, sometimes even in the hardest situations, asking myself the question, so what am I here to learn? Rather than it's easy to critique or get frustrated, but what is it that I'm here to learn? Why is this happening and what can I contribute in this situation. I think the third thing that is really important for me is um, I've lived a mission-focused life that is not focused on me and what I'm going to achieve, but focused on the success of the institution, the success of students, the success of my staff and faculty, and letting that be the driving force for all the decision-making, the collaboration, and the direction for what it is I was to do. So those three, authenticity, being a, being a learner, and being mission-focused are really, really key to me as a leader. 
I want to be Cameron when I grow up. <laughs> um, I think those are really great comments, excellent. And I think those are things that we all really should and, and try to aspire to. Uh, I, I think I had a few things written down, but you've kind of thrown me off track with your comments. Um, I think personally, I, I like to have fun. So I think if we're not having fun in what we do every day, and I mean that in not a um, reckless way, but in a, uh, I think we all learn by having positive work environments, have, have, relying on positive experiences with our teams, having positive experiences with our students. I think happy students learn better. Um, sometimes they do frustrate you, and it's okay not to be happy, but it's, uh, I think those are also really important. And being authentic with your students and with yourself and with your, with your team. None of us can do these jobs alone. So I think it's very important to build and nurture and be present with your team. For me personally, the biggest challenge is we all get so busy doing things, administration, that we don't make time to be present with our staff. So if, one of the things that I constantly try to work on regularly, because it's something that's it actually sounds maybe easier to do for me, at least for me, than it is, is to actually make time for individual staff, listen to what they have to say, what their concerns are, because really, they really know more what's going on most of the time than we do, at the, and or at least it's important, because they can't, we won't move forward if they can't move forward. So it's important to have, you know, regular, real conversations, not just staff meetings and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I think, Really finding just being yourself is, is, the, is the really important. So that's my list completely covered yeah. as well. And <laughs> Give them I was ticking them off as, as you're saying them. Um, so I mentioned my, my eclectic um, journey. And, and the thing that I always try and do is, is look at anyone I'm working with and think, is there something I can learn from them? So I think it's Karen said, the sort of continual learning piece. And, you know, if you've got a, a, a boss who's a piece of work or anything like that, think what does he or she do? That's, that's interesting or is different um, or, or is something that I could learn from. So I always try and stick with that. A couple of other thoughts, though, that, again, has sort of been paraphrased, but I'll throw them out there anyway. Um, my first position with any responsibility, if I don't count the paper round, um, was in Japan where I, I ultimately led a team that got quite big um, in corporate training, uh, which was language but also cultural. So we worked with British Airways and Shimano and Mitsubishi and others who sent their employees to America or to the UK typically and said, some of them were saying, you know, look, I can deal with the language, but the British Airways cabin crew keep sending me to clean the toilets, and how do I tell them that that's not fair because I did them last time? Um, so we did quite a bit of scenario-based uh, role play and that sort of thing with that. Um, but the point about the Japan thing was they have a concept that <clears throat> you shouldn't really go into a meeting without knowing where everyone's going to go. So they actually have a term that, that translates as sort of packing the roots. I'm not sure why that, but uh, nemawashi, which means you do sort of sound people out. And, and my boss, it's funny, I'm sort of going on the bookends of my career. That was the start. And right now, my boss, who, who is uh, interesting, um, great person, um, she will often call me and say, you know, have you, have you sounded this out with the deans? So we've had a few initiatives going around, and you know we've got a big executive meeting or something coming up, and she'll say, have you socialized this? And I'm like, well, you know, what does that mean? Um, <clears throat> and I've started to do that a lot more, and, it, and it's reminded me that going into a meeting, knowing where people are and giving them a bit of a heads up never hurts. So you know, occasionally of the nine deans that I deal with, one will say, well, look, I've got a bit of an issue with this. But for the most part, they just say, no, look, that's interesting and, and great. Please that I'm informed, and I'll come in and have uh, not, not necessarily to back you up, but just are interested and appreciate that you took the time to sound them out. Um, and I think, you know, I'm relating that at sort of higher level with deans, but I think, again, as, as the other two panelists have said, it's important to get that from, the, from all levels. Um, and the Japanese also have a fundamental belief that a different perspective can give you a whole different set of insights. And if you've terrorized your staff to the extent that they won't say, this looks terrible from here, then you've not done a good job. So that piece as well around taking the time and um, making people feel that you do listen. So I, I had that early in my career, actually. Someone who, uh, when I was at Marlborough as, as the director, just didn't fit in the position and she left. Um, but I said, look, you know, sorry it didn't work out. Was there anything I did that could have been better or could have set you up? And she said, oh, I came in for one meeting and you were kind of checking stuff on the computer. And I thought that's, that's probably fair enough, to be honest, because we are super busy. Um, and I hadn't realized she was coming in with a major, major issue. I thought it was a sort of time of day, quick check-in. So I think that's an important lesson to get, and, and that was a decade or two ago. So um, 
I think it is important to, I'm, I'm not judging, put the lids down and sort of connect and make sure that people feel, okay, this person's listening to me, even if it's for a short period. So I think that's sounding out that, um, as I say, they, they call it nemawashi. I, I don't really know why they call it that. But um, The other piece was the sort of getting back to Paul and working with him as a leader. I'd seen his Marlborough, let's do this, and then, uh, and it was always a very self-effacing, uh, humorous climb down. So he played, he was a big basketball guy, LeBlanc, because he's tall, and he will tell you that he played with Obama before he was president. Um, uh, Southern New Hampshire was the first stop after Obama had declared his presidential campaign. So Paul has the signed basketball and the photos, and, um, and we'll tell you about that uh, at great length. Um, but as I say, I inherited these memos. Paul would say, okay, we're going to do this at Marlborough. And then he'd say, oh, I was, I was playing basketball with Mark Franselin, who was one of the program directors. And I realized when he was really missing his three-point shooting that this wasn't going well with him. So I took him to one side. And it was a very self-effacing, you know me, guys. I'll go for it. And it's not right, so let's go back. Um, so he made a lot of decisions, some of which ultimately ended up being brilliant, and many of which he just, without a qualm, said, look, you know me. I try this, and it doesn't work. Um, he left. Marlborough and his successor, a, a wonderful woman called Ellen Lovell, took over. She used to work for the Millennium Foundation with the Clintons, so very well connected, very wonderful woman. Um, came in and said, okay, I'm going to listen, because I heard that Paul made a lot of decisions without full consultation, so I'm going to really listen. And people said, that's great, breath of fresh air, someone who's going to listen to us. And about a year and a half in, people started saying, when are we going to get decisions? So I think that sort of decisiveness as a leader with humility to roll it back if you need to, um, I think is a, is a value. And not being overly hasty and making decisions without the sort of consultation, but getting consultation from as high a level as you can down to as, as low a level if you can, because the perspective that someone might have from, from their vantage point can be something that you just haven't seen or thought of. So that's it. I kind of heard several themes, um, authenticity, mission-driven, have fun, um, know where people are, listen and value people, and never make a mistake, make it a learning opportunity and continue to roll on. Those are, those are all traits that um, you know, have, we've seen in action and probably good things we can all learn to practice. But um, as a leader for these groups, I'm a thought leader in our field, what is the biggest opportunity and biggest challenge that you see in online and distance learning today? Do you want any one of us to start? Or? Uh, I'll, whatever. Okay, so I'll start again. So um, I see the biggest challenge and the opportunities are like two sides of the same coin. Uh, and so I've got a number of them that I've listed because I think there's multiple challenges and multiple opportunities. Uh, one of them that I think that's really significant is a focus on quality. When I look at the number of institutions across the United States, around the world perhaps, getting an online education, um, those of us who've really worked hard to make sure that we've refined what those that learning experience is and have focused on it, I see a lot of schools jumping in, and somebody even mentioned yesterday jokingly that you know you can't just throw up your PowerPoints in your syllabus and think it's going to work. And yet that is, I think, something that is still happening as more and more traditional schools go online. And I don't know um, how to address that, but I do think that is a big challenge. Another uh, an opportunity, I think, that is out there that's kind of on, on the, the cutting edge of things is the emergence of technology, especially artificial intelligence. Um, I had the opportunity to visit with Watson and um, spend some time there and explore what that would look like on campus. And there are tremendous opportunities there for freeing up student services, advisors, uh, admissions folks with a Watson type tool to be able to address the general questions that come across that are very normal uh, and very consistent and happen a great deal. The challenge, I think, is that we don't want to um, become automatons, and we need to ensure that the students have a human experience as well as get their questions answered. So I think there's a lot of uh, research and creative thinking that needs to be done in this whole 
um, AI world, I also can see a place in the learning environment for uh, aids or AI to assist. And I think it's going to take an amazing amount of faculty and academic engagement, and not just technologists telling us how to use a tool, but our engaging with them and doing the research on the impact of it for it to become something that helps us move forward in the learning experience. I mean, I've got others, but I'll let um, the, the, the panel here share theirs, and we can have a conversation, no doubt. Um, challenges and opportunities. Well, I mean, I think the opportunities are actually quite exciting and quite endless, and there is a lot of great things going on. Um, and then, but institutionally, I also see a lot of challenges because I've heard and I've heard some of this um, these themes this week. Is that I mean, historically, distance education was in one box and classroom teaching was in another box and never did the two meet. Even faculty taught one or the other. And then we started having faculty do both. Now we have students that are doing online and classroom and blended and hybrid and technology enhanced and something else. So I, the whole game is blurred now. And I think uh, 10 years ago it was very much in different boxes. And I think that's causing institutions to have to reflect on how they deliver services, how do we provide equitable levels of services, student services, um, to off-campus students, whatever that definition means. I think we'll never get definitions ever again of what those boxes are, and we can just get over that and uh, move on, and we have students, and we're all trying to give them a really good learning experience. But um, in addition to equality, I see big movements in that, which is fantastic, but I'm not seeing as big a move in some areas about the levels of student services. And I mean, on-campus students do have access to a different level of student services than uh, distance. And we really need to make that more equitable. Um, in some areas, particularly what I've seen in California, some things that are happening are great in terms of some of the, the things they're bringing in. But in my college, I see students, for whatever reason, be more comfortable identifying, and it's good reasons, uh, that they need more help. And I think as an institution, we do need to be able to provide them with more help in whatever that might mean and give them supports to help them become able to be a better learners. So that's a big area as a challenge and an opportunity I think I really would like to see institutions focus resources on. And yeah, help faculty, and actually the other piece of that is to help faculty support uh, students in that area. Because if we don't, it's okay to, you know, train faculty. I mean, I have our Center for Teaching and Learning in teaching skills and uh, educational technologies and all those wonderful things. But at the end of the day, if a student has a barrier to learning and a faculty doesn't have the skills to uh, identify that and to know about it and to help, you know, guide you in a direction where they can get supports, at the end of the day, that student is not going to be a successful learner as they potentially could be. So we've got to help fa support faculty to support the students as well in a broader area. No, look, I agree, and I think, I think, again, both made excellent points. I think the opportunity, I talked about this on Tuesday um, in the Newton session that I was leading. There's, there's a lot out there in terms of emerging technologies, but my concern at the minute is that we chase them maybe too quickly, and they get applied as sort of look at this bells and whistles type thing, um, which, you know, we could name the technology Second Life, et cetera, that that's happened with before. So my thought is if we look ahead, let's make sure that we really leverage the opportunities of things like artificial intelligence, you know, we're looking at virtual reality, augmented reality, um, and keep tying it back and saying, how does this improve the student experience? So I think there's a great opportunity with emergent technologies. There's a great risk that we do them badly or hastily and don't really understand, and they just sound good. Um, and then I think the other part that Teresa really hit well was the, the blurring of the lines. So uh, at Western, when I interviewed, they talked a lot about what they did in online, and it sounded like they were very far down the line, and you know they were they were um, just ready to take it really to the next level. And yet, when we got in, when I got in, um, realized that they hadn't really done online in a strategic or, or thorough way. So there was a lot of oh yeah, it's an online course, but you have to come in for placements and exams, and you have to come in for this session. I'm like, well, it's not really online. Um, so of the 40-odd online programs that we, we thought there's only about seven that actually you can do fully distant. So they haven't really sort of built that. And part of the reason they haven't is that everything is blended. So they've tried to move away from lectures in the traditional, and they have a lot of um, 
you know, depending on your terminology, hybrid or blended courses where the face-to-face -face component is reduced. And what they've done, because again, I think it sounded cool, was they've flipped everything, which means in some cases, here's the worst example of that, um, they have a lecturer who was kind of bad and didactic and lectury face-to-face, -face, so they videoed that and put that online <laughs> for an hour and a half, um, which didn't make it any more watchable. Um, and then the academic staff member who trained with ed tech folks said, oh, okay, now it's flipped. The, the stuff that I teach is online. So in class I can do, like, what, really cool stuff, right? And the students come, haven't sat through three minutes of this, and say, you know what, you need to go over the lecture again. So you get a bad lecture captured, put online, and then a bad lecture re-gone through in face-to-face. -face. So you lose everything. So the point of that is, I think, you know, you've got to be really thoughtful about modality and why you're doing it. And again, look at the student. If a student has self-selected for online, I'm great with that. I think that's excellent. Our, our biggest challenge is um, early days at Southern New Hampshire were students who jumped across to online and said, oh, I'm taking this online because I heard it was easy. I don't want to go to class. Don't want to have to make an effort. And I play a lot of hockey, which was great. Um, and, and the key thing, I think, at Southern New Hampshire was that we had a lot of dialogue between Paul, myself, and Provost Patty Linett. And we'd have that sort of loop, and, and we would guarantee the quality markers. Um, and, and I think maybe we'll talk to that a little later. But we had about 15 or 16 things that we would look at. So when Patty called me and said, there's a student who's grieved because he got this terrible experience in online, and I'd look across the markers and say, that class has none of the 15 that are shown as a red flag. And, and we actually take this off record. I, Robert is going to look at me now because I did a presentation here a couple of years ago, and I, I accidentally slightly swore at one point. I did. It's online, full video. It's about minute 37, if I remember correctly. I contacted Alex and said, is there any way you could cut that out? But she didn't. Um, so we actually had an FOS check at Southern New Hampshire. Was, is the student or the person who is grieving full of something, let's say? Um, and, and that sounds disrespectful. It wasn't. It was a shorthand for, let's have a quick look and see if this class has a problem because we've got a grievance about it. And in many cases, it wasn't. It was just that the student had been told, sometimes by advisors, that take it online because everyone gets A's. So a student who's self-selected for a face-to-face -face experience shouldn't be shuffled across to a blended, flipped, or fully online if they're not prepared for that. And likewise, you know, we keep dealing with the, the cannibalized word at Western now, which I've dealt with throughout my career. A student who's self-selected for online for very many, often very valid reasons, that isn't a cannibalized student. That's a student that you wouldn't have got. So I think just, you know, being clear on what you're doing and why you're doing, but tying it back to the student and saying, what's this person really looking to get out of the education? I completely agree with the student service bit and the possibilities that are ahead of us. And just to summarize some of the things I'm hearing, this uh, challenges our, our quality, which we all know about providing quality student services that are equitable to that which is on campus. Um, and, and the issue of just chasing the new technologies just because they're there. And the opportunities present the other side of that coin, as Karen said. Chasing new technologies, we need to be asking, how does this improve the student experience? Um, we need to be supporting faculty to provide better students' uh, services as well, and taking advantage of really the new technologies like Watson, and maybe it doesn't just happen on the instructional side, but on the student services side as well. So um, as our next thing we wanna look at, um, we, we talked about the, the swirling of the students too, but so many of us are involved with the online students, and that is becoming a bigger portion of our population. And um, so the question I'm gonna ask is, what is the percentage of online enrollments at your institution? And in Dallas now, right now, we are up to 36% of all of our enrollments are online. That's over a third of our enrollments are not sitting in classrooms. And in the summer, it's over 60, it's about 62%. So we sometimes, I I don't even know that our board or our presidents really realize what a big online institution we have become. Kim? Pam, we were having a discussion about that yesterday and um, trying to make sure that we understand when you say, um, did you say 36%? Is that in number of students? Is that in number of registrations? Is that credits? Is that, how are you counting that? It's not students, it's the classes, the enrollments the students are taking. So a third of the student experience is in an online class. You might call it enrollments, you might call it 
credits. Uh, there might be different things, but, but that's what we're counting, not just students, uh, because of the, the big blending thing. So you really do need to not necessarily look at how many students are studying totally online. What, what's really happening with your population? Um, so, um, Karen, well, you, so, you've actually so got the answer. 100%. Um, 100 percent of the students, the enrollments, the registrations, everything is at a distance. There are no students, there are no faculty located at our campus in West Virginia. Uh, everyone is globally dispersed and really it's globally dispersed. And how many faculty do you have? We have about 2,000 faculty um, and about oh, 1,200 staff members. The staff are primarily located in Charlestown, West Virginia, and in Manassas, Virginia. Uh, we have two different locations there. Okay. Um, well, we have, um, like I said, we have 17 campuses plus our overseas campus, and in addition to that, we have a, about almost 15% of our students are online. So. It's probably much higher if I, you know, used your, um, because we don't count students that are doing blended or partial or video live or any of those types of, these are students that are in fully online, don't come to campus in a program code in our, in my, you know, our system that is coded to an online program. Um, and they graduate from a certificate and everything. So that's 15%. But I suspect it's probably closer to a third, actually. It would be interesting to go back and um, to do that calculation. Um, it, the challenging part for us is that it has actually grown almost 60% in the last five years. But you can be sure that our resources and uh, haven't grown by 60% in the last five years. So um, we actually just did an institutional re review of our distributed learning center. And uh, I, we popped, uh, Tricia yesterday mentioned it in the, uh, the speed round, the speed dating thing that we had there yesterday. and. Um, because of this growth has caused a lot of stresses on how we do things. And we do need to look at how we do things leaner, more efficient. We're looking at a whole lean management process is actually for our college and particularly our, our online. So because of that growth has caused, and we use SUNY's institutional readiness tool. We modified it somewhat. And Kim and Alex and others have been uh, extremely helpful to us, which is part of why we're here today, to help us do that with our institution. And it's a fantastic tool. We have a. We, out of that came a um, report, which the review, but also we did a big action plan, you know, taking the 75 indicators, uh, actual actions and indicators from there. And um, we just presented it to the board on Friday. So now we have the fun job of trying to figure out how we implement this. But having that action plan created from the SUNY tool gives us, I think, a fantastic framework because one of our strategic goals is obviously to, you know, increase that uh, percentage from 15 to more. So. Um, that connects a lot of dots as to where we're here today. Um, so I mentioned how confused um, our institution was. They, they had about 40 online programs um, and then a lot that were blended. So our, our unit of, of modality, we have units that speak to courses, um, which took me a while to get used to. But almost every course, every program has on fully online, what they call fully online units, most of them are blended. So, you know, somewhere around 50, 60 percent of our students will have some units that are fully online. We're at only probably about 10 percent, less than that, who do fully online. What I did when I went in was a sort of inventory and then looked at options. Um, the enrollment and economy to an extent had dipped in Australia between the time that I interviewed, which was about a year and a half before I turned up. Um, and no one actually sent me that memo. So I interviewed and, and everything was looking really good. Um, Australia took the caps off and said, everyone should have an education, so everyone please try and enroll. And then this last year they've said, oh, hang on, that costs us a lot of money. Can we put caps back on? Um, so we'd had sort of ups and downs. Um, but in the online space, I'd looked across and thought, this is so varied, to use a slightly positive word, um, that there isn't a consistent model for what is online. So. I was tasked with um, ramping that up, given my SNU and to an extent Northeastern background. So we looked at the possibility of ramping up internally, and I priced that at, at you know, in the millions of dollars. Um, and then we uh, looked at potential partners, and we ended up partnering with a group called OES, Online Education Services, which um, is sort of the organization behind Swinburne Online, which is one of the few universities in Australia that have done it well and systematically. Um, and <laughs> I went down to visit them in Melbourne where they're based and said, wow, this environment, this setup feels kind of familiar. 
And they said, oh, yeah, you're from America. Uh, not really from England, but lived in America, sure. Um, and they said, actually, we benchmarked an institution. I don't know if you've heard of Southern New Hampshire. So um, they'd actually sent people up to Southern New Hampshire after I left and sort of benchmarked what Paul had done there, which was, you know, take it off campus. It's in the mill yard in, in uh, Manchester. So in Melbourne, they've got this environment that's sort of, you know, as I say, onefoot.com, onefoot academic, and they, they, they do it well. They did it well with Swinburne, and they talked to their board and said, can we now maybe get another couple of partners? So we decided to go in with them, and I did that specifically because it was distinct and separate enough and done well enough that I thought it's, it's a, almost a pure environment. It's in a different learning management system from ours. Um, they run Canvas, where Blackboard. So it allowed us to get an install that was almost you know, lock, stock, and barrel in one box that is run well that I can then use to sort of track back. So we're looking at what they do, which are things that are very familiar just in terms of, track, of tracking, a bit of analytics, academic staff training, that sort of thing, and taking those lessons. Um, I had 30 people in my institution uh, go through Quality Matters training, which is sort of known in Australia, um, and it's getting established. And I said, well, look, let's put them through, and let's have them all look at the OES stuff and then go back to their schools and departments and say, okay, we've got to at least match that. So I'm using a sort of third-party quick ramp-up to give us some exemplars and lessons that we can then apply back um, because it was going to be too hard to sort of chip away at all the little ambiguities, if you like, of what we've been done. But we're, we're sort of new with that. We've got about a 1,000 students in that relationship, and we had a term start that starts on Monday, if I make it back. So let you know how that goes. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about um, both student services and um, how you prepare your courses. So I'll, since we were just sort of talking about academics there, um, do you use, do your institution use master online courses, one course developed by subject matter experts and that's used by multiple faculty, or are you doing the individually developed course model or both? Karen? So um, our we originally had faculty developing courses, but as we grew, when the institution has probably about 1,800 courses now, and a faculty member owns a course and creates a master course for the rest of the people that teach that class. So if you have 100 sections of English 101, to ensure that the students are all meeting the same student learning outcomes, a master course would be designed. The faculty are handed off the master course about 10 days before the class starts, and they can add to it. They cannot change um, the assessments or what is in there for the, the required readings or the assignments, but they can add you know, their own special interests or some things they want to do and can bring their sense of who they are into the discussions and the discussion boards throughout. So a master class is the norm. To the extent, um, that it is an upper level course or um, an advanced course in a graduate degree, there is a lot more freedom given to the faculty to add more in those courses than there is at the 100, 200 level or even the 500 level of a graduate course. So that, that adds that. And then from a student services perspective, all of our student services are provided at a distance. We have some 70 or 80 student organizations. We have the largest Golden Key uh, organization and membership of the, in the country, uh, around the world, actually. We have um, many activities that we do in regions around the country so that we'll host events so that people can have that sense of being connected to people in not just in the classroom in a virtual way, but in a real human uh, touching way. So we'll, we'll go to New York or Los Angeles or New Orleans and host events for people to come to. We have a lot of outreach activities that are done. There's active social media. Uh, all of the advising is done at a, different, at a distance. The um, career counseling, there's a significant approach to career counseling. A lot of places come and ask the people on, who run those teams to teach them how to do it, especially from a traditional campus who doesn't, who's trying to learn how to serve students remotely in the same way they serve them on campus. And you can offer the same services, they're just done differently and they're done more virtually and you do them more in communities of folks. So there's a lot of richness that's been, we've learned in the process of implementing it, but we have the full service offerings for all students, no matter where they are. 
Now, for the military, especially um, when we were, we were founded as American Military University, we didn't need as much initially. As the institution has grown and over time, we have added more because the support for military personnel has also been cut back on military installations. And so while they'll have um, assistance there, it's not what they once had. So being able to provide more and more services has been a key part of our strategy in order to support student su success, persistence, and completion. Um, key to all of this, too, is people say, well, as you add resources, what about the costs? Truth is, over the 15 years, we increased tuition once for undergrad students. And that was like $20 a credit hour, uh, only once. We have cut costs. All, to it, all school uh, course materials and books are included in the tuition at um, $250 a credit hour or $270 a credit hour. When we increased the tuition, we did not do it for the military soldier. Uh, so that the service members, which were 60%, didn't get the increase. It was only just the, the civilians. So we have done things to increase our services, inc expand our offerings from student services, expand the ability to do quality course materials while not increasing cost. How are we doing for time? I think we're getting tight, are we? I'll, I'll be real brief. Uh, we do use master courses for our online, and then we share them out for different sections as well. It is a bit of a juggle, a balancing act because you do want to allow faculty some creativity in their courses. We do require that uh, they stick to the uh, assessment um, outline, you know, this percentage from whatever the assessments are. But their assessments themselves and how they go about doing that, that's generally up to themselves, depending on. Um, but they kind of share most of their assessments, very very much the same. Um, all of our faculty and all of our campuses and all of our courses and all of our students have access to their course in the uh, LMS. We use Desire to Learn, so even an on-campus, every on-campus student even gets access. Now, our online, of course, they use that 100%, but our, we, about 60% of our on-campus faculty, we've, we just finished a survey, use the LMS to support their on-campus sort of building in a little bit more blended. And it might be just the notes, it might be just using Dropbox, they all have to use the grade book uh, actually to do their grades. So uh, we would like to see more of those resources. So uh, the on-campus ones, we give them copies of the courses, but it's a little bit harder to control. And particularly we have a lot of programs on campus that we just don't have developed the same way that we have our online courses developed, right? So. I'll be even quicker. Our, our Western Sydney courses that uh, were there when I got there are um, definitely faculty developed, faculty driven. They do their own stuff. As I've mentioned, they are uh, esoteric, is, is a nice way of putting it. They're, they're, um, yeah. the, the, the OES partnership is, a, as I mentioned, a sort of Southern New Hampshire model developed, subject matter expert, instructional designers launched and very consistent. Australia is very, very tight on equity. So the biggest discussion I have to have all, all the time is around um, the face-to-face -face outcomes and the online outcomes and are they the same. We have to report, the, the assignments have to be identical, which is a disaster because some of the practices they have for face-to-face -face are, are really um, not suited at all to online and we're working through that. Um, we have to have a, a meeting, the School of Business one went for four hours last term where the online uh, assessment results are presented to the School Academic Council and they compare them across and see if there are any ambiguities or things that look like red flags and they dig in to a, a very uh, a thorough degree. Um, so we have to have that consistency. The exam has to be the same. We're shifting from a instructor developed, instructor driven to a master um, faculty member and, and, uh, and iterations. Um, student services, uh, consistent across the board, all students pay a, a student administration fee that we reinvest in their services. Um, I'd say again, probably more so in Australia than here, students go to the online institution that's nearby. Um, so we have 70, 80% of enrollments are, are in our immediate catchment area. And for that reason, we make sure that when uh, student issues get to the sort of psychological needing support, counseling sort of uh, extent, we've got people who'll talk to the online students when they come in. So it's all done online, but if it got serious or, or a student turned up at campus needing support, they would get it from the face-to-face -face staff. Very good. 
Um, there's lots of questions. I'd like to follow up on, on this as well, um, but, I, but I, I would like to um, have time for the audience. So let me just ask each of the panelists um, to briefly give us one piece of advice you have to future leaders in this business, this part of education. <laughs> I mean, just be persistent, uh, be patient, and um, keep trying. Like, you know, when you, it's okay to, it's better, was it uh, one of those things you see on the internet? Is you, miss all, you miss all the shots, you don't try, or something like that, one yeah. of those uh, lines. So, I mean, that's actually true. I mean, so I don't think anybody has the winning formula figured out exactly yet, because all our institutions have their own cultures and unique, and you're still trying to, to marry all those pieces together and make it work. So, you know, what works in my institution may not work in yours. Um, and also, you know, reach out. Sessions like this are fantastic where you meet people, you learn from each other. I think, um, you know, the best things I've learned is by, you know, uh, f having conversations and coffee with people or, or online. And, and um, I think there's a wealth of knowledge. We have a lot to learn, but I think we also, I think it's fantastic. I mean, students are, um, I think we have opportunities to help educate people and reduce barriers that we've never had before. Um, be it if they live in a rural area, be it if they live, uh, if they have some, you know, if they want to stay home and take care of a family or if they're traveling or if they're a hockey player or whatever it is that is going on in their life. We have, they have an opportunity like never before, I think, to continue and expand their education and to have more selection education. You don't have to take a course in this. You can, you know, think this together. And I think, you know, that's a fantastic opportunity, and uh, we can, it's, it's really exciting. It's really exciting times in educational technology and in education online, and uh, things are changing quickly. So uh, I say enjoy the ride. And, and, uh, <laughs> I'm now very conscious of the fact that I dissed a hockey player and I'm sitting next to a Canadian, but it was a, it was a specific example. Um, look, I think that's, that's very valuable, and I think we've talked on a, a few elements about the importance of connecting up and connecting down and making sure that you stay in touch. I, I, I've tended not to do that very well. I tend to get my email and bang it off and it's off my plate and it's off my plate. And then that actual notion of stopping and making a few appointments and saying, look, can we grab a coffee? Can we grab a coffee? I think it's very valuable. Um, I think the bit that ties it back together is, is as Teresa said, to, to not forget your end point in this. Um, I think it was that Christy McAuliffe who said, you know, I teach because I touch the future. So what you're doing is impacting people for 20 years and 30 years, whether you know it or not. Um, and when you look at students, as you say, people take online courses. I've clarified this with the academic staff who, who aren't in favor. I'm like, they're not doing it because they dislike you. They're doing it because, you know, they are our students. And Western Sydney's a, a, a very developing area. It's growing really quickly. Our, our institution has more first and family immigrant students in their population than any other institution in Western Sydney. So we kind of think ourselves as having that responsibility. Um, and, and to lose sight of that, I think, is very uh, uh, dangerous. So we keep emphasizing, you know, students choose the modality they do for reasons. Um, the students that we take online are our students, but their lives are so complicated they need to do this in a different way. So having that sort of empathetic perspective, I think, and, and focusing on the fact that this ultimately is for students, they are the ones who are going to go out and uh, change the world and make a difference, I think, that gets some doors open and then keep having the conversations with those open doors. And uh, just they've summed it up really well. I would just say uh, continue to be, do what's right for the student. And uh, for me, it's also don't take yourself too seriously. Have a great sense of humor and be able to laugh at yourself, especially with the people you work with. Because uh, if you can be humorous and acknowledge what you do well and don't do so well, they'll be freer to interact with you as well and be willing to make mistakes. Um, before I open up the questions to um, Liz, did apologize because she couldn't be here, but I did ask her just if she would give me a little bit of information on where she saw the future going, and these are her words that she wrote. I see a future in higher education where students are able to move seamlessly among various learning formats, face-to-face, -face, hybrid, fully online, just as we've been discussing, um, based on their personal preferences under the guidance of faculty who are well prepared to deliver highly engaging learning experiences. I would also hope that students would have a greater ability to curate their own learning content, including more accessible, high-quality, open educational resources. I foresee greater use of virtual and augmented reality to engage the learner's senses to a much higher degree than ever possible before. 
greater use of simulation and robotics in the instruction of basic and clinical sciences, and increased adoption of adaptive software for more personalized self-paced learning. Finally, I hope that higher education faculty and administrators will embrace the cultural change that is necessary to affect technology-mediated pedagogical, pedagogical innovation, and that we find new ways to improve, to improve and provide more affordable learning pathways and the kinds of credentials that students of the future will need to be successful in their careers and lives. So even Liz, who has not heard this discussion, is in line with everything that has said too. But actually listening. She's online. She, um, Liz, thank you for being there. <laughs> uh, so we, we are um, you know, experiencing your input from here as well. Um, and, and Liz represented another kind of university. So there are, there's probably not one model that fits everybody because we all do things a little differently. But um, as we move forward, I think we're all going to be facing the same um, challenges. So are there questions from the audience that we can also answer? So um, Liz actually uh, posted a question for the panel. Uh, just trying to participate from afar. Um, and also, um, uh, just sent her apologies for being unable to be here. She said, can the panelists comment on the challenge of faculty preparation and willingness to embrace pedagogical innovation with technology and online delivery? Well, I mean, that depends on which faculty you're talking to on which day. I mean, um, you know, I think there's a spectrum um, for different reasons. However, um, it was interesting because we had a faculty member present to us, I don't think she's here today, um, Sherry Boyd, on Monday, on Tuesday. And I did ask her that question directly as a faculty member, as a faculty member, Sherry, you know, how do we get more faculty like you? Because, I mean, Sherry's really innovative with her teaching and practices. And she said, you know, one of the things that they did at their institution was um, they had formed this committee and they had to kind of apply for it and they got 20% release time. And you know, that's part of it is that we need to remember that this stuff takes time. So we do need to give faculty time and uh, to learn it themselves, to be able to ex and give them the freedom to experiment with it and give them, let them have feedback. So that's one thing I would add. And I think that, I mean, I, I don't think this, we can classify faculty as one type or the other because I think we have some that are of all different interests, and uh, we just need to support them and give them time, give them the tools, take away some of the frustrations, and um, help them understand the value of it and work with us, so. Part of it is just giving faculty the, the time to learn the skills they need to learn to be successful in a virtual environment. And as technology changes, I mean, a real example is the math faculty started to use new tools well, the students in those math classes did much poor, they were doing poorly. Uh, and as we analyzed it, we realized the faculty hadn't been taught how to use those tools in that class. So setting time aside for the faculty to learn how to use the tools and to use them effectively in the classroom with students, once we took them and did that with them, the, the students exceeded the prior use of those resources. So that's an example to me of I think faculty want to do a good job. They want to be successful, and you have to help them be successful. I, I would agree, and I think you know a lot of it's sort of tying it back to their strengths and passions. A lot of it is is just fear of failure and change. And I think as administrators, we've got to watch that we don't say, you know, we've decided to go with technology X, and you all have to do it. Um, you know, you've got to unbundle that and say, what's it going to get? You know, is that a concept that you feel is valuable? So I. I talk quite a lot about that when I, I present on what I'm doing around things like uh, appropriate level of challenge. So most academic staff, faculty that I talk to will agree that it's a great idea not to confuse the hell out of people. It's also a good idea not to talk down to them and have them bored within five minutes. And, and research tends to show that people who look at a challenge and say, I've got a 50-50 chance of getting this. If that's the initial impression, that's when you get the maximum student motivation. And then, you know, having had that discussion, I would come in and say, right, let's talk about how maybe some technologies or tools could help you get there. So I think focus on the principles, some of the, you know, the, the motivators that are very clear. No one likes failure. No one likes to be talked down to. No one likes to not get feedback for three weeks, those kinds of things. So, so get the buy-in at a level that is a common language for you and then 
honestly, you know, often throw the technology in kind of last. There are, I say that, I mean, there are functional tools like Gradebook that everyone needs to know, and that needs to be just in time training, done five times, bit of peer pressure, bit of student pull, use all the tools at your disposal. But for most of the evolution type discussions, I would always try and tie it back to motivators and, and get agreement, have a conversation about what they're hoping to achieve with their teaching. And, and keep that one going and then sort of, you know, see what, how we can help with the technology. I, I, I really don't like going in and saying, okay, here's a technology that you're all going to love. It's going to, you know, it's going to be rocket science. Or, you know, my teaching's terrible. Can you show me which button to push? Neither of those two work. It's got to be an agreed upon function that's going to motivate students. And then let's talk collaboratively about how we can achieve that. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, quick question, primarily for Karen, I think. But to have successful students, you have to have successful faculty. We support the faculty. You had thousands of faculty. <laughs> um, how do you support the faculty technically and to assure quality in their course designs? Uh, I mean, right now I'm looking at accessibility and you know, it's not a learning curve for me. It's like a learning cliff. <laughs> so, I mean, how do you support these faculty as far as they're all over the place? It's not like you can go to their office and say, hey, let's work on some instructional design so that your students can be successful. And so, Karen, yeah, Karen, make sure you, you talk about the, your, your process for the course design, too. Right, so we have an instructional design team and a faculty member will work with an instructional designer for the design of the class to put it into the virtual environment. And then we have a center for teaching and learning and they will work with the faculty then to teach them how to use the tools in the class. So there's constant workshops being done on the effectiveness of using various tools, various methodologies, uh, whatever it is that a school dean or a program director has indicated their faculty need, they'll begin to build learning modules that then get pushed out. So the way it's organized for us, so while we have 2,000 faculty, they're like in little clusters. So the school owns the faculty within that school. Each school has program directors. Um, there's probably across the six schools maybe 70 program directors. The program directors own the content and the faculty who build that content. We also have faculty directors who manage the faculty performance and go in and observe them teaching, give them feedback on their teaching and how they're using things in the classroom. So over time, we've built a fairly sophisticated model rather than when we first started, we had program directors doing everything, the curriculum, the faculty, the whole nine yards, and realized it's too much for one person and something suffers. So we divided it up between faculty directors and program directors within a school, and the faculty directors pay attention to the coaching and the mentoring and the advising and the guiding of the faculty and helping them succeed while the program directors focus on the curriculum with that same faculty. So it's more of a hybrid management model for that. Each of the courses, if they're going to design a new course, they have templates that, I mean, we've, we've grown over time. There's a template they'll build it into. Then we have a media team that'll take and put multimedia. We do the 508 compliance check to make sure everything's there. So this has been 15 years of evolution to get to a fairly sophisticated approach to doing it. And it's still not perfect. I mean, while it's, it's effective and we're getting there, it's still not perfect. You know, we'll still uncover courses and you wonder, how did that happen? Or, you know, or you find a faculty member who's kind of like um, MIA. How did that happen? So you, there's, there's with, with size and scale, it's a lot harder to keep and pay attention to everything all the time. But you do the best you can. How do you um, handle the issue of academic freedom? Academic freedom is defined as being able to have the conversations in the classroom that are there. It's not about I get to pick the book I want or I get to design the course the way I want. That's not academic freedom questions. It's around their perspectives and what they can share about their perspectives as they're guiding the instruction and teaching it in the classroom. So we don't have the issues around, you know, I want to use my book or 
you know, it's, we just don't have those kind of issues. Yeah. Are your faculty unionized? No. <laughs> no union, no tenure. Uh, they're all co uh, contract employee. Not they're employees, but we're also an at will employer. Um, that's quite different. Yeah, our faculty are all unionized. Question over here, uh, Karen, and all panelists. Could you provide a little information how the department chairs bring all of these dispersed faculty? together uh, as a cohesive group, have alignments across the curriculum? So we have several tools, uh, Adobe Connect. Every faculty member has Adobe Connect. Every faculty member has the Microsoft uh, version of um, whatever it is that tool is. That's, I forget the name of it. Skype, Skype for Business. So they have regular meetings once a week with all the faculty, and we used to do it where it was, it was phone meetings. And you know when you're doing phone meetings, everybody's doing something else. So now everything is video conference. So they all see each other. They may still be doing other things, but they're visually up there. They have to look like they're paying attention. So um, <laughs> that we've moved to having that so all of the, the program directors, all of the faculty have that so they can do the same thing with their students, and we have put that into the system. Also, program directors and faculty directors come together three or four times a year as a group to kind of do strategy and thinking together within the whole of academics. And sometimes they will, um, if there's a conference, a discipline conference, like the Academy of Management for Management and Business, they'll host an event for their faculty at those kind of um, conferences to get people together face to face. Hi. <clears throat> what about employers asking on job applications the location of the degree and whether it was an online or a brick and mortar institution? Besides quality, what methods do your institutes use to verify the credentials received by the students are equivalent to the more traditional programs? And do you feel your degree's purpose are to help an individual develop skills for employment? Well, um, I mean, they, our online students get the exact same diploma as our on-campus students. so. We don't, in Canada, maybe it's just my, you know, perspective, we haven't had employers say, did you get that, you know, degree or diploma online or did you get it on campus? We haven't had any feedback from students saying that's ever been an issue. Um, so I don't know if it's, maybe it's, maybe it's different where there's institutions that are fully online. Our uh, online programs are accredited the same way as our on-campus, exactly the same way. So they have to go through the same rigor and review our assessments, our faculty credentials, and uh, so it's the exact same accreditation process as we would use for, uh, and that's external accreditors. A lot of our programs are externally accredited. The other thing is uh, we've been finding, though, is that we have a number of, like office administration, diplomas, communications, uh, like two or three year diplomas in business, accounting. We have employers calling for students on work terms to our online um, unit saying they would prefer to have an online student because they find that if they've had an online student before, the online student is more comfortable with technology, they're better at sending emails, they can do Outlook, they can do Skype, they're not terrified of setting up video conferences. So they're actually have, yeah, we've been finding this, because most offices now have some component. If you're in an industry, particularly if you're, in, well, maybe Newfoundland, maybe in Canada, but if you're in an industry, you are having video conferences with somebody in some office somewhere, somewhere in the world. And we have a big oil and gas sector and big mining sector. <laughs> And we have, you know, companies from all over that are in Newfoundland, in our oil and gas, and Norway, and and so there is a lot of uh, that type of industry happening. So they're hiring graduates. They want them to have that confidence and that skills. So we're actually looking, you know, our dean's actually looking at that now. Maybe there's a component that the on-campus is actually missing out. So we've been encouraging our students not to shy away from listing those things on their resumes and getting those work experiences. So I think that's an interesting trend. We have time for probably one more question. This is kind of looping back, I think, to um, the original, the first few questions. My question, uh, my question is really more about mentoring. Um, as leaders, uh, how would you describe what you feel are the most important um, tips you could offer 
is in terms of mentoring your colleagues and also staff? So coaching and mentoring, that was one of the things I would have added um, if I would have spoken again, so I, I appreciate the question. Uh, coaching and mentoring and building the next generation of leaders is the job of every leader. Um, sometimes it's having them follow you around and be in meetings with you. Sometimes it's just spending time with them as they try to sort through their issues and they're trying to work what they're working on, giving them guidance and support. Um, we've done a lot with um, next generation leadership programs. Uh, we've partnered with Civitas Learning to offer the Next Generation Leadership Academy at APUS and had 30 people go through it this year, last year, 30 this year, 30 next year, um, and ha handpicked the people who are the emerging leaders on the campus. So spending time, I think that was the most important thing I did as a leader, is spend time with the people uh, who work and report to me, spend time with people who seek me out and want time and just be available to them um, to answer their questions, support them, encourage them, and help them find their way. And even for many of them, it, sometimes it means they may have to go look somewhere else, not just stay where in the same institution, being open to help them explore what is their path and what is their journey and what, is their, what are their goals for what they want to achieve. Mark? I think just, I'll just highlight one thing is that we have a, a formal mentoring program that we use called Chair Academy in our institution, um, which is a fantastic program. It's, um, actually, we just have a class yesterday, graduate uh, for this year that have gone through it in the last year. So we have formal mentoring, but I think as equally important is the informal mentoring. And I think it's, you know, we all should seek out mentors in our life, be it at work or otherwise, people that, and people are open to it. You know, maybe it's a coach. Um, because your mentor, it's not maybe someone at a certain level. Some, don't pick your mentor based on their position or their title. Pick, you've got to have a chemistry of some sort. So I have three individuals that I officially mentor right now. We meet monthly, and we also meet informally when things are, um, you know, when, when they, whenever they want or whenever I feel. And one of them is a, a faculty trainer, one of them is an instructional designer, and one of them is actually a, a carpentry instructor. So, you know, it really, what we have found, I've personally found that you get as much out of mentoring as you do. Maybe they get nothing out of it. I don't know. But I actually enjoy it and get something out of it. So I think you're right. As leaders or in any position, I think seek out mentors, people that can help guide you, either short term or long term, and, uh, and encourage those opportunities for people to, to share what you know. But I don't think it also just has to be a formal mentoring program. I think you can be doing informal mentoring all the time. And I have one of my employees who um, credits my encouragement for him to go on to finish his bachelor's and then go on for a master's degree. And he talks about the time when he finished his bachelor's that I stood in the hallway and made everybody that went by congratulate him. And then he came back and later and said it was just that piece, which I don't even remember doing, but that was the thing that made him go on to get his master's. So, you know, I think as leaders, you're always looking for the opportunity to help someone along. And sometimes it may be just as simple as, as a word of encouragement at the right time. Time. So, I mean, all of that's critical. As Karen said, that's probably our most important job when you get to this level is encouraging the next generation to be as good as they can be. And, and Liz commented on some of that, too, um, you know, in her comments that, that you need to treat um, all your colleagues with respect and care and listen carefully and respond thoroughly to issues and concerns. So um, I think mentoring is, is critical. And thank you for that question. Did you have one more question, Mark? Yeah, if you could uh, speak a little bit to financial leadership. Uh, we haven't talked very much about money today. Uh, and I think we all know that the cost of technology, the cost of innovation, uh, the cost of change uh, is quite high. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about making sure that those discussions don't always happen in the VP of Finance's office, but rather they're pedagogical decisions rather than purely financial decisions. 
So I'm going to jump a little and refer to my earlier answer. I think, you know, I've, I've mentioned Marlborough and others where I've had budgets that would make you cry, and then, you know, I'm overseeing quite large budgets at the minute, but it, it comes back to the principles. And I'm actually, I, I teach a class periodically that I'm in the middle of at the minute, and a lot of the students are saying, <coughs> what technology should I switch on? How do I make it work? And it's around gameful design and gamification, which is kind of my thing at the minute. Um, and I keep saying, look, just paper prototype. Just go in. People are really forgiving if you you know, try something different, even if it doesn't necessarily work first time. And the problem with technology is if you lock in and it's not appropriate, then there's nowhere to go. So as I said before, I think if you can agree around principles and then tailor it, I'd like to think the class I've got at the minute, there's about 30 in, and they probably range from having $1,000 a unit to develop up to you know, 20, 30,000. If you can afford the high end, great, go and get a vendor and do a really great adaptive learning course that will we'll put 10,000 students through. But if you've got you know, $100 in yourself, then play with the LMS and try and, get, try and get a similar principle in. So I think there's that awareness that there's just such a range of circumstances and it's important to, again, boil it back to the why you're doing it and what you hope to achieve and then, you know, assess, cut your cloth accordingly, I suppose. And I, they've always said for a long time, technology shouldn't be bolt-on technology. You really should be using the technology to do something in a different way, not just ramping up what you've always done and now putting it into a technological form. That just does not necessarily scale well and can be very expensive. So, I have one thing to ask. Yeah. If you don't understand the cash flow statement, get yourself a course. Because um, if, you're in, if, you are, if you are in administration or you're aiming to be in administration or leadership, you're going to have to deal with budgets and budgets and budgets. It's not something, and I think a lot of people are not comfortable with budgets and dollars, and you do rely on your VP of finance, and that's the biggest mistake you can make. I'm just, you know, just if I was mentoring you, that's what I would say. And I was fortunate that I did my first bachelor was in commerce and business, and I did those accounting courses not realizing at the end of the day how valuable they would be to me. So you need to build, you need to have the skills as a leader, as a manager, to build business cases to justify what it is you need because your team and your faculty and your students are depending on you to get to share the pie. Let's just be honest. And you need money to be able to do things. Um, but you need to have solid rationales, solid business cases. You need to be doing it for the right reasons. It's not because I want the biggest you know, screen or the newest, latest toy or I saw this and this looks really good. It's not about that. But if you're not doing that, I can assure you the other managers are. And when they go to the VP of Finance for your budgets, and I work in public education, so there's never enough to go around, um, they're going to have their case and it's probably going to be better. It's always about you know, choosing. So make sure you have your business cases done. So if you're thinking about that route in your take an accounting course, go online, get a free course, take an accountant, get the, really understand so you're not intimidated. So when you go in and they talk the language, then you're, it's a foreign language. Like accountants talk different language. And they'll say, you know, this, this, whatever, you know. You, you understand what you're saying and you can translate. And then, because, you know, everybody's coming in with a really good case. So you really need to be able to talk the numbers. So that's my advice. Well, excellent. Um, I want to thank our panelists. Um, Karen, Teresa, and Kevin, and Kevin for stepping in uh, just this morning. Uh, thank you, and Liz, who also contributed from a distance and has been um, online with us, too. So thank you so much, and thank you for your questions, too. All right. We're going to keep rolling right along this morning. And... Uh, our next presenter you actually saw uh, yesterday when he accepted